first on opening statements for five minutes is uh, Sheriff Mike Winters. Uh, good evening. I'm Sheriff Mike Winters. I'm a third term uh, sheriff. I'm running for my fourth. Uh, I started out in 2003. I got elected in 2002, sworn in January 2003. Prior to being sheriff, I, uh, I had a construction company. I uh, served as a reserve at the city of Ashland for three years. I volunteer firefighter, worked for the Oregon State Police for 15 years, was on uh, several teams there uh, that they had, a recruit coach, did various things like that. And, uh, and in, in addition to that, I always had an interest in agriculture and uh, raised cows and had a construction company. In 2002, I was asked to run for the uh, post of sheriff, the office of sheriff. And, uh, and so I took on that challenge. And so far, it's, uh, I think we've done a good job. I think Jackson County, if you, in your spare time, go back and you look at the Sheriff's Office, uh, where, where we started in 2003, and you move it forward and look at where it is today, uh, compare the records, look at the counties around us, I think you'll find that the Jackson County Sheriff's Office is a top-notch outfit with excellent officers, good equipment, and can handle the, uh, you know, can handle the tasks that are uh, thrown before us. There's really not much that uh, that you can put out there that we can't handle anything from uh, criminal cases to high level rescues at the top of Mount McLaughlin. We, I mean, we do it all. We do it well. Uh, uh, I'm proud of the record. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff Winters. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, if you're, especially if you're a March Madness fan or a basketball fan, and you're sitting here tonight. Uh, thank you. But uh, this is a little bit about competition. Uh, my name is Corey Falls, and I am running for Jackson County Sheriff. I grew up in the Valley. I'm a I'm a Roosh kid, and I've lived in uh, Jackson County for a large portion of my life. I see in uh, running for Jackson County Sheriff as as a call to public service to improve the quality of life in our in our Valley. I have uh, broad experience in law enforcement. I have 16 years in law enforcement. And currently, I'm the deputy chief of police for the Ashland Police Department. And my duties there include, I'll act as the chief in the chief's absence. Uh, right now, I oversee our support division, uh, which includes all our records personnel and our detectives. Prior to that, I oversaw all our, all our patrol officers and patrol supervisors. and been a deputy chief since 2011. Prior to becoming a deputy chief, I was a lieutenant at the Ashland Police Department where I had similar roles of overseeing our detectives and patrol, and I've commanded all divisions of the uh, police department at Ashland. I started my law enforcement career in 1998, and I started in the state of Washington. And in Washington, I worked for two agencies up there, a suburb of Seattle called the City of Bothell, and I worked for the Snohomish, region, uh, the Snohomish County uh, Sheriff's Office, which is the third largest sheriff's office in the state of Washington. The state of Washington is where I got my uh, boots on the ground uh, experience. And I was involved in SWAT teams up there. I was assigned to the Sonoma's Regional Drug Task Force as a detective for three years. And then I worked all facets of uh, large county, urban areas, uh, rural areas, all over, all, all different aspects. I was also a firearms instructor. Uh, my pr professional, I also have a professional leadership experience in, in policing, and that includes the FBI National Academy, which is a 10-week program for police commanders uh, from all over the world that get selected. They only select eight people to go to this out of Oregon every year, so it's an honor to, to have been chosen with that. I've also attended the Senior Management Institute of Police, which is put on by the Police Executive Research Forum, and that is a Washington, D.C.-based organization. And essentially what this program does is it brings police commanders from all over the United States back to Boston, pairs them up with uh, Harvard instructors from the Kennedy School of Government and talk about innovative strategies to, love to uh, run police organizations. And then fortunately, uh, I was able to go to the National Institute on Violence Against Women uh, last fall, where they only invite chiefs and deputy chiefs to learn about innovative strategies and best practices to combat violence against women. <clears throat> Academically, I have a bachelor's degree in health and human performance. I have a graduate certificate in criminal justice education. I have a master's degree in organizational, <coughs> organizational management, and hopefully by the end of this year, early next year, I will be completing my uh, doctorate degree in business administration. 
with my uh, dedication to this county, with my level of executive trainings, uh, with my level of experience, I feel qualified to run for sheriff. And as your sheriff, I will focus on uh, being open and responsive to the, to the community, uh, fiscal management, and bringing a collaborative leadership style to Jackson County to lead it into the future. Thank you all. And next is Lieutenant <coughs> Bob Sergi. Well, thanks for inviting me here, uh, Ray, Loma, Debbie, for organizing this, <coughs> Kevin for moderating this. Uh, Anyways, um, I do want to introduce my wife, uh, Teresa, back there, my biggest supporter, and uh, she did a great help on the campaign. Uh, a little bit about myself, I moved to the Rogue Valley uh, in 1989, started with the Sheriff's Office, uh, spent a year there as a deputy, and then moved over to uh, the Metro Police Department where uh, eventually I became a, a patrol sergeant part of the SWAT team as a team leader and, and had uh, many different positions in, in that organization as an instructor, uh, program manager. I, I was a program manager for emergency vehicle operations, uh, defense and tactics. Um, so training uh, is, is very important to me. I think uh, training should be a basic function of any law enforcement. During my 34 years of experience, um, I've been, like I said, the, a patrol sergeant. I've also been jail commander, patrol commander. I'm currently a SWAT commander of the sheriff's office. Uh, I'm assigned to corrections right now. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm running for sheriff. Um, you know, uh, sheriff has done a great job up to this point, but we've kind of lost focus on, on which way we need to go. Looking to uh, lead this agency back to the primary mission that's law enforcement. Um, like I said, we've kind of lost focus. We can we can do that within budget, and that's my first intention. Um, my education background: uh, I've got a bachelor's degree in business administration. I've got uh, about 4,000 hours of training uh, through DPSST. I've got. Uh, all the DPST certificates up to the management level, both corrections and uh, patrol side of it. I'm the only candidate with those kind of credentials. Uh, I know this agency inside and out. I know the employees. Uh, I've worked with all of them. I know their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, the strengths are, are the uh, employees themselves. We're just not using them to their full potential. And I think we uh, need change direction, so uh, I think we need to be a little more fiscally responsible, and I know, I know where the wasteful spending is, and I can reduce that. Thanks. Okay, next is the questions. Uh, each of you will be allowed one question for the other candidates. Okay, so first is uh, <coughs> Lieutenant Sergi, your question for Deputy Chief Falls. Corey, on your website you state, according to the Jackson County budget, the issues facing Jackson County include inadequate staffing in the jail. You also state Jackson County expected to force release 5,100 inmates out of the jail during uh, fiscal 2012-2013. Can you tell us what is inadequate staffing to you and how it relates to the force releases? If, we're force, if we have to force release that many citizens, then I believe that's what inadequate staffing is. Uh, is, is, that your, is that your question? If, yeah. if we're releasing, we're projecting to release 5,000 inmates from the jail, then part of that is because we don't have staffing. Now, now the Sheriff's Office has added, I believe, 60 beds to, uh, to the Jackson County Jail, and they are trying to hire more bodies to, to staff that, and that, that will help with our force release. But uh, it's just being able to have the staffing to keep people in jail. Thank you. And uh, do you have anything to come to about with? Yeah. 
not entirely correct on that. The, the, the cap and the, re the reason for the releases are uh, from a, uh, a court decision that we, we complied with many, many years ago that capped our jail at 230. Um, the, the staffing can handle more inmates than that, but because we have that uh, agreed upon cap, which was uh, due to a potential lawsuit uh, for not having enough uh, beds, uh, we now have a cap of 230. We could go up higher, um, but because of the way our jail is set up, um, it's it's better to be able for the deputies to um, to focus or be able to classify and move those inmates around. So the staffing is a very small part of that cap. It's mostly to do with uh, a potential uh, court suit and it helps with our uh, movement for uh, inmates so we can better uh, manage them. And to, to address the staffing with the, to the sheriff's office, part of the problem is, and it states this in the budget, part of the problem is they're, they're doing a lot of staffing with, with overtime. And, 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 and that, is, that is a problem. Uh, when, you're, when you're talking about uh, staffing the jail, if you have to staff on, on that on continuous overtime, uh, I, I see that as a, as a problem. And your question for Sheriff Pointers. I'll call, him I'll call him boss because that's what I usually do. So, boss, on a recent article in uh, the Oregon State Sheriff's Association magazine, you talk about groundbreaking technology being utilized and purchased through future concepts. Uh, how much has Jackson County paid to future concepts in the last 18 months? <laughs> The answer is I don't have the exact amount. We've probably spent a million dollars on uh, on technology, uh, as you've seen with the sheriff's offices around us. Uh, we have a, a lot of uh, we're a small force, and you have to be able to make uh, the best use of the people you have, and technology is what makes best use of that. The systems and such that we're going to, uh, and because we need to be able to manage emergencies of all scales to serve the citizens and be able to respond to any emergency because we are the Jackson County Sheriff's Office. Uh, we have to be able to handle things county line to county line. The days of uh, riding the horse around are gone. The days of uh, having just a radio is gone. The new de technology moves information in real time. And so we're instituting it. Uh, we've formed a tactical operations center there at the Sheriff's Office. Uh, we have multiple monitors and stations. We are also the backup 911 center to EXO, so that it, in the event that you have a, a plane crash into the building or have to evacuate the communication center for some reason, we flip one switch and all the 911 calls come over to our new center. Uh, I'm sure that if we have some kind of an event at the heartbeat of the county, which is the 911 center, that you want to be able to have us uh, switch quickly, which would have taken days before we put the system together, uh, to answer your calls. The fires don't stop, the heart attacks don't stop, the motor vehicle accidents don't stop. And I'm going to position this county so that we have uh, a real-time information center, that we have the redundant backup to the 911 center, because uh, when bad things happen, I am in charge and I have to get things done. And so I'm going to do it with the number of people I have. I'm going to be as efficient as possible and I'm going to be there to serve you. You don't want a bunch of excuses uh, when bad things are happening to you. When you dial 911, you want somebody to show up and you want trained folks, you want good officers with good equipment uh, to handle the situation. And the Jackson County Sheriff's, they're second to nobody in the state with the equipment and the direction that we're going. I just want to, um, the fact that we spent over a million dollars on this uh, 
the system is part of what uh, my introduction was, was the uh, wasteful spending, and uh, I'll eliminate that. <laughs> is really I think it speaks for itself I mean if you're going to be the sheriff if you're going to wear the hat the boots and the seven point star you have to be able to be ready to respond to the needs of the community if you don't have the equipment if you don't have the vision if you aren't prepared the people that are going to suffer at the end of the day are the citizens of Jackson County and uh, I'm going to be prepared it's as simple as that Lieutenant Sir Sergi. Uh, next, and I realize I'm going out of order for those of you who are looking at the agenda. I apologize for that. But next will be Deputy Chief Falls. Your question? Ready for candidate. <coughs> Bob, if you could just explain uh, your executive management uh, experience running a division and uh, supervising supervisors. And how long? Take it out of the thing. There you go. Throw the stand away. Yeah, good idea. Uh, well, um, as a patrol sergeant in Medford, I uh, and the SWAT team leader in Medford, at any given time, I, I supervised uh, anywhere from eight to, to twenty people. At, when I came over to the sheriff's office, I was the jail commander uh, for about a year, and then went to uh, as a patrol commander for about a year and a half. Uh, I've uh, been to several commander schools, which, which includes command, uh, a jail commander, a tactical commander, and, and patrol commander. Are you currently supervising supervisors right now? I'm working as a lieutenant in the corrections, doing a sergeant's job. And your question for Sheriff Winters? Sheriff Winters, can you tell us the uh, average response time it takes a deputy to respond to a call? The last time we run the numbers, the average uh, response time to a priority one call in Jackson County was 14 minutes. And, and with that, uh, what have you done to improve your response times? Uh, we're starting to roll out new technology that will uh, better manage all of our assets. It shows the, the uh, tricorders that we've issued to everyone. It, puts, uh, it shows the position of the deputies. It shows them within three feet of where they're, they're yes. at. Uh, it, we are able to look onto the screens in the Tactical Operations Center and see where any of our resources are. Uh, we're working with ECSO at uh, some point to start working that technology into the uh, Communications Center so that we can better manage all our assets during any type of emergency. Thank you very much. Before we move on with you, Sheriff Winters, I'd just like to tell the audience that this is your last chance to get your questions in. If you need an index card, please raise your hand, and one will be delivered to you. Please write legibly, and uh, that way we can have them in time to ask questions. Thank you. Sheriff Winters, your question for either candidate. Lieutenant Sergi, uh, I just want to see your vision for the, I want you, I'd like the explanation, I guess, or your vision, basically, for the Jackson County Sheriff's Office if you're elected sheriff. First six months, I'm going to add four deputies uh, to patrol staff um, without uh, affecting the, the budget. It'll take some reorganization, but the full-time employee uh, uh, equivalencies are there to do that. I'm also going to replace the sergeants back in the patrol. I'm going to uh, try to increase the patrol staff to make this community much safer and reduce that uh, response time. And that'll be interesting, but I'm, I'm glad that's a good point. Uh, Chief, uh, Deputy Chief Falls, uh, can you give us your vision for the 
Jackson County Sheriff's Office under your uh, leadership, sir. Yes, I can. Uh, today's professional policing organizations, you, you do a couple things. Is, is one, when you guys call 911, you expect somebody to, to respond. So we certainly want to look at uh, how quick, quickly and efficiently we're, we're getting to calls. And the, the second thing we want, certainly want to look at is the impact of the community with things. So if we're telling the community that we're force releasing uh, close to 5,000 people a year, how does that impact the community? And, and, and as, as your sheriff, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at these things. We, we want a professional law enforcement agency that is constantly using their funds to send officers to calls as quickly and efficiently as, as we can. We, we want to reduce the impact to, to, the, uh, to the county, whether it's uh, an in, increase in crime. We have an increase in crime in Jackson County. We have an increase in, in drug problems in, in Jackson County. We have mental health issues in, in Jackson County. And uh, these are all uh, things that certainly I would look to uh, address as your sheriff. And, and, I, and I have to say this, because I think this goes without saying a, a lot of times when we talk about uh, sheriff or, or, or moving different uh, priorities around, we have to remember that our number one priority in, in law enforcement as a sworn officer is to protect the constitutional and civil rights of citizens. And that would be a, a, a big proponent of mine. Your response to those? Well, I hope he. I hope he can do all that if he sits in the seat. He's going to have to get it away from me first. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you, you guys are are very you know soft spoken. Don't say a whole lot. You can loosen up. It's okay. We're friends here. All right. Good idea. <laughs> okay. I guess we will go into um, into questions from the audience. So, first question is to all three candidates. Uh, keeping the 10th Amendment in mind, how would you protect the citizens of Jackson County from unlawful federal intrusions into their lives? Who's going first? How about we start, start with you? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, so just so I have the question straight, the, the concern is the federal government infringing on the rights of the citizens in Jackson County? Is that the basic question? Correct. Based with the premise of the Tenth Amendment in mind. Um, well, um, as the top law enforcement official in, in Jackson County, um, we have certain duties to uphold, and, and the first one is to uphold the Constitution uh, of, of both the United States and of Oregon. If, um, if the federal government is going to try to violate their own Constitution, then that's something that we'll, we'll uh, not tolerate. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't see that happening, uh, but if it does, uh, uh, like I said, the sheriff is the the top law enforcement officer in, in the county and would take appropriate action. Very good. Sheriff I think I'm on record with, uh, in many cases, of supporting the uh, Constitution. I've, I've stood tough on tough issues. Uh, I'm on record with the fact uh, that uh, there will be no federal intrusion into Jackson County uh, as long as I'm sheriff, as long as I'm sitting into the seat. With that said, I want to say that uh, I, I work with federal partners, and a lot of the things that we do, uh, we have federal partnerships, and we have received grants and all types of funding streams. But those grants and those funding streams are reviewed, and uh, if, the, if any type of the uh, regulations, the contract, anything was to be uh, uh, start to get intrusive, or if they think that we owe them, uh, we wouldn't accept that money, but we've had a good working relationship at this point uh, with the federal government on the, on the drug war. Uh, we've taken uh, billions and billions of dollars of illegal marijuana off the forest service lands and the BLM public lands, uh, and a lot of that is, 
is due to the fact that we can get some uh, federal reimbursement. So I, I, I work with good federal partners. Uh, we have good conversations. We have good partnerships. Uh, but uh, nobody's going to come in and run over Jackson County. The, real, the reality of a situation like that, if, if the federal government was going to come in and violate anybody's certain rights, the, the federal, there's not a lot of federal law enforcement in Jackson County. They would certainly need the help of local law enforcement because we outnumber them. And certainly if, if the federal government is going to do anything that's unethical or immoral or unconstitutional, but certainly put a stop to that. But uh, we do work with them as, as partners, and if they were, if there's a fear that they're going to come in and, and do a lot of those things that people get concerned about, whether they're going door to door or things like that, uh, they would need the assist of local uh, law enforcement. And with me, if I felt there was anything that was out of line, I would not support that. Thank you. Next is to all three of you again. Um, is there really a need for a MARPA or MRAP vehicle in Jackson County? And if so, please explain why. I can take that on first. Yeah, I, I think there is. And, and we have uh, two SWAT vehicles in this, this uh, valley. And uh, I think the, the, real, the real question comes to, do we need two SWAT teams in this, in this valley? I think our taxpayers would go a long way to consolidate and have one SWAT team. But with those armored vehicles, and, and I've, I've been involved in SWAT operations for a long time, we could probably get by with one in this, in this valley, but, but with those, SWAT taxes have changed over the years. And SWAT is really slowing down their, their, their tactics. And to have an armored vehicle to, to pull up at a residence and be able to call people out safely is really the, where, where law enforcement is going. When I first got onto SWAT in, in Washington uh, almost 15 years ago, we were knocking on doors, hitting it with a ram, and, and moving through them as fast as we can. And that's just not the tactic anymore. And the more equipment we have to keep our officers and to keep our tactical officers safe, that's, that's the, uh, the, the need for us. So, do we need to? I, I don't know, but uh, I think the question needs to be, do we need two SWAT teams? We could consolidate those for this county, have one uh, armored vehicle to uh, keep our deputies and our police officers safe. Next. Me? It's fine. Okay. Run it on down. Uh, yes, we, uh, we definitely need that vehicle. That vehicle uh, keeps our officers safe. The, the, reason that we got that is we tried using a, a, a coin truck at the time. It was an old one that Eugene uh, SWAT gave us. And it, uh, it broke down. It would, it would not detour uh, rifle type ammunition. Uh, we had a gentleman that, that was uh, barricaded out in the uh, Eagle Point area. Uh, he was shooting at, uh, at our officers. Uh, it, there, I can't, you, you as the taxpayer, You've got a lot of money wrapped up in these people, and uh, because when we when we hire somebody and we give them a car, right right then and there you have one hundred and forty thousand dollars put in them. Before they get out on onto the road and stuff, you're going to invest another one hundred and fifty thousand. So you're going to have about three hundred thousand dollars per officer out there, and uh, you know we're protecting investments. They have families. Uh, I'm just not going to risk their. Uh, I'm not going to risk their lives in that way when we can do things safer. What, what we've noticed is that when we do uh, take that vehicle out to those types of situations, it usually uh, ends the barricaded sub, uh, situation so that we don't have to uh, use force entry and end up with a bigger problem, either officers killed or, or uh, suspect killed or the place burnt to the ground or any of the things that can happen out there when things go bad. So. Uh, that vehicle is a is a very good vehicle, and it save it actually saves you money. Uh, it shows uh, it shows some uh, force through strength of using it on those uh, particular situations. That's all it's used for, uh, for the most part, is those those real high risk, dangerous uh, situations that we can so we can keep people safe. As far as two. Uh, SWAT teams and con uh, a consolidated team, the Jackson County Sheriff's Office years ago approached uh, the other SWAT team and asked them uh, regarding regionalization. Uh, they, they, for uh, for reasons unknown, have, have not wanted to do that. Uh, so, so I did make that uh, approach. 
But what we have been able to do, and I think that really works for all of us, is the Medford uh, SWAT team is a, is a good city team. They're, they're a good uh, uh, urban team. Uh, I would respectfully say that they're probably not as good in the woods and out in, in places like that as we are. I, I would say that uh, my guys, my team out there, uh, are some of the best in the woods. And that's where we've done a lot of work. And so uh, they, the two teams train together. They work well together. Uh, when, it's a, when it's a real specialty deal in the city, I think the city does a, is a great team to have there. And when, you, when you get out into the woods and a long ways from home, Jackson County SO is the one to call. You're not going to find any disagreement about the, the SWAT vehicles for me as, as the uh, Medford SWAT team leader and the sheriff's uh, SWAT commander, uh, those uh, pieces of equipment are vital. And I'm not going to put a price tag on it, but I would ha hate to be uh, part of an operation where uh, we couldn't protect one of our guys and had him hurt or killed. Uh, um, so it, 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 these vehicles are like insurance uh, uh, for our guys. It protects them. They're effective. Um, they are intimidating, that, and that's what they're designed for. You, you pull up into a driveway, and uh, the bad guys see that sitting in the driveway. They, they don't want any part of it. And we've had more cases where we just pull up in the driveway, call them out, and they come out because they know they're, they're, they're uh, pretty much outgunned. Even if we did consolidate the, the two teams, which I do advocate that, uh, I've actually talked to my team leader about that. Uh, most of the guys on our SWAT team are uh, uh, proponents of that because we know that in a large operation we don't have enough guys uh, to pull that off. You know, we'd have to call Medford anyways or the state police. Uh, I would prefer to keep both vehicles. If you have a consolidated team, you're talking about 20 to 25 guys and uh, one vehicle would not be enough for that size of a team. Uh, but I am a, a fan of the, of the Bearcats, uh, vital piece of equipment. Thank you. Next question is to each of you also. Can you please state your understanding of the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution and how that relates to, your, to how you would advocate policy regarding the Fourth Amendment in your office and the actions of your deputies? Fourth Amendment has to do with uh, unlawful search and seizure. And Fourth Amendment is coming into your homes, uh, coming onto your property, and uh, by law, if we're going to enter your home uh, without a hot pursuit or something, we need a, a, a search warrant. And certainly, if, if I were the sheriff, if, if we're... Uh, homes are the most personal thing to, to people in, in their lives. You know, they're, uh, a person's home where their family is. So. To intrude that and to go into that is a big deal. And uh, the Fourth Amendment protects that. They protect people's, people's home. You have the right to defend your home. You have, to, you have different rights in your home if people try to intrude, intrude on that. So certainly any, any operation that uh, the, the Jackson County Sheriff's Office would be involved in uh, where they're going into somebody's home to, to seize property, to seize evidence, uh, would certainly require uh, that they have a search warrant. That's the way it is now. Uh, we would we would keep it that way. To to get a search warrant, you have to have probable cause to get a search warrant. You have to talk to to a district attorney, and uh, have to submit it to a judge. So there's layers of of accountability there before you you do that. So uh, certainly we would continue those practices. Uh, to protect people's uh, Fourth Amendment rights when it came to unlawful search and seizure. We follow the Constitution. I think we have a strong uh, history of it over 12 years. I don't know uh, an area where we violated it. If we have uh, ever done something, I wish somebody had pointed out and give me the facts, but I, uh, I don't believe that we've uh, you know, violated any part of the Fourth Amendment and, uh, and we follow the Constitution. Uh, the Fourth Amendment deals with search and seizure, and, and that is one of the most uh, 
litigated and uh, fought over interpreted uh, part of the Constitution that we dealt with in law enforcement it is constantly changing and that's part of what why training is so important search and seizure laws almost change every year depending on, on what part of the country you live and what uh, what circuit court you're you fall under jurisdiction so it's very important to stay up on the case law uh, training takes care of that um, the the search and seizure laws can can throw a case out as quick as anything else uh, that you have to deal with and so it's imperative that uh, Law enforcement stays on top of that as far as the case law goes. Uh, I'm not aware of uh, intentionally violating any Fourth Amendment rights, uh, but mistakes do happen, and um, if, uh, and sometimes cases get thrown out because we violate, violated those. But like I said, training is part of that equation. These guys have to know what search and seizure rules are, and it. Uh, it should be a requirement for everybody. Thank you, gentlemen. Next is for all of you again. Do you understand that you are the most powerful law enforcement official in the county? And how would you be willing to use your authority to stop uh, federal officers or officials from entering the county In other words, would you be willing to instate a policy and or make a promise today to instate a policy that any and all federal agency officials check into your office and that you be briefed before they move forward on your citizens? I'm not sure, sure where that question um, comes from, but um, even though I the sheriff is the top law enforcement uh, officer in the county. We would have no powers to require federal law enforcement to check in with us if they wanted to uh, enter our state or our county. It, it would be nice if they, uh, if they had an operation, just like uh, any agency coming in the county, to inform us what they're doing. Um, it, it would. And I think most agencies do that just so we know what's going on, uh, and even if they need mutual aid. Uh, but if they don't want to, uh, I'm sorry, there's, there's nothing in the books that I know of that we can prohibit federal officers from entering the county. Actually, there is things on the books that, that uh, that can mandate that. The way that I've approached it as sheriff is that, uh, uh, I, like I said earlier, I work closely uh, and try to work closely with the federal agencies. We are short-staffed in law enforcement across Southwest Oregon. Uh, we are underfunded in a lot of respects, and it takes everybody to try to provide a safe, environment for the citizens to live in. With that said, I've had many, I've had conversations. I've, if the federal, I haven't caught them doing it here in Jackson County. I, ha, I, I have federal folks that work in my office even uh, on a cold case squad, a homicide uh, squad. And we have people that, that uh, we work with and we, the sheriff's office, have not seen them violate uh, rights or such. But if, if for some reason they wake up one morning and they decide that they're going to go and, uh, you know, go door to door, go door, to door uh, unlawful searches, if there's any kinds of issues, uh, I'm the sheriff of this county. And I'm going to be the sheriff until you decide that I'm not going to be the sheriff. And uh, I'm the kind of guy, I don't shrink in the face of danger. I will stand tall and I'll do the right thing to protect the citizens of this county. And I think I have a history of doing that. In terms of a specific policy to have the federal government check in at the sheriff's office, I, I wouldn't do that. Here's what I did, would do. A, a lot of these concerns come with land rights, closed rights, mining rights. Uh, these things certainly have to be uh, kept an eye on, 
and if if the federal government uh, would, were, to, were to try to do anything that was uh, unconstitutional or unlawful, certainly I would uh, keep an eye on that. But but what one, one thing I would do is let's let's open up the lines of communication. I, I would want to hear from uh, the people that. Uh, where roads are closed and where some of the miners and, and, and here's more about some of those specific issues because a lot of these concerns come from those things and certainly we need to, to talk about those issues and, and keep a close eye if the, if the, uh, if the federal government uh, wants to impose its will that is against the citizens. Uh, at the end of the day, the sheriff is the last person uh, standing this, this county and uh, the federal government can come and go and certainly I'm here to answer to the people and would keep a close eye on that. Thank you. Sheriff Winters, this is posed to you. If um, the other gentleman would care to answer after, that would be fine. Sure. It seems that your constituents want to know what you are doing in Northern California dealing with marijuana issues there when you have just as many issues in your own county, not to mention some that may be even of deeper concern regarding marijuana, heroin, and other drug use, not to mention the concern of the rise in domestic violence and other issues. Could you explain why you are outside of the county when you are needed here and using ta taxpayers' dollars to do so? Sure. Uh, we do go to to Siskiyou County and assist them. Our deputies are cross-designated with the Siskiyou County Sheriff's Office, and their deputies are cross-designated with uh, the Jackson County Sheriff's Office. There's areas of Siskiyou County that are e easier and quicker to get to uh, coming through Jackson County. Basically, a lot of that area out past uh, Applegate Lake uh, and Cook and Green and that. Uh, so the sheriff and I down there, who I might add is a constitutional sheriff and a good man, uh, they, they, we work in partnership and we go back and forth. This, the drug dealers, they don't know uh, county lines and they don't know city lines. And you have to think big picture. Being sheriff isn't just about running the city police department, you know, or, or some piece of it. it. That's all important, but, but we're talking big time stuff. We're talking cartels that are coming in from, from Mexico and they're taking root on our public lands where our people want to hunt, where our people want to ride their horse where they want to go out and ride a motorcycle or hike, and they shouldn't have to worry if they, they are out doing those, uh, those functions that they're going to run into a cartel grow. It just shouldn't happen, and it shouldn't be uh, that we let it go, go by. The Jackson County Sheriff's Office has taken off $1.7 billion of marijuana. You know what they do with that, folks? They take that, they take that and turn it into cash. It's a huge cash crop. And then they take it down to Mexico, and they get all the precursors and all the stuff to make the meth and the heroin and everything that you see coming back into this community. And so where's the market? 206,000 people in Jackson County is the large piece of the market. It isn't the few thousand down in Siskiyou. It's not the few thousand over in Josephine. The large market, our kids, our schools and stuff is right here. We, we work well with MADGE. And Madge does all the interior type stuff, works the cities and uh, the various places in, inside of Jackson County. And, and they do other things too. The Jackson County Sheriff's Office team works a bigger picture. So we have a good working relationship with the Medford City Police Department. We've divided uh, the task of uh, getting these drugs off the street where you know, they work a, a lot of the city stuff and, the, and some of it goes out a little bit in the county and we work the big regional picture. Uh, we are trying to clean this up so this stuff's not coming back into your community. And the match team and the summer team from Jackson County are doing one hell of a job. Sheriff Winters, could I ask you to um, please explain what match is? And can I ask the folks to please turn off your cell phones? Madge is the Medford Area Drug uh, Gang Enforcement Unit, and they, and they do a great job. They're, it's a multi-agency task force, uh, which we're a part of, I might add. And then the, uh, the, the county team is seven Southwestern sheriffs working together. And, and we are, uh, and, well, I should say seven Southwestern Oregon sheriffs and two in Northern California. And together, we have band together to try and marshal our resources. If you're in Josephine County, do you, you know what you get over there? You got a man, you got a sheriff sitting over there with a good heart. He's a good man. 
He's one man, and he's got a couple of deputies. And so I'm not, you know, they, these people get over there and they get a, a foothold, these criminal enterprises get a foothold, and then they come over into Jackson County and over into the city of Medford and the city of Ashland and, and stuff. They don't know any boundaries. So we take this thing head on. It's serious business, and we do it well. Can I follow up to that? Absolutely. The, the sheriff's office has taken a lot off, taken a lot of marijuana off, uh, but I wonder if it's reduced the the ability to get marijuana, and uh, that's the the movement towards legalization still allows uh, people to easily get marijuana. The cartels are not coming around as much because it's so easy to grow marijuana with a marijuana card and, and distribute it. So uh, what this means when we're going to several different counties to, to, to pull marijuana plants is we're, we're using uh, county resources outside this county. We're using helicopters. We're using SWAT teams. There's a $1.3 or $4 million budget in the tactical narcotics team for, for the county. And uh, the, the supply and, and demand, I haven't seen that change in, in, in Jackson County. So I think there needs to be a focus on, on getting away from getting out of our county with all those resources and that money. And there needs to be a focus on how we're going to keep drugs away from kids and marijuana away from kids. And let's talk about all these other kid issues that we have locally. And those issues that we have locally are mental health issues our domestic violence issues, our increase in heroin, our child abuse. Let's put some money and resources to those because those are impacting our community every day. I, I, I've been on a lot of those um, marijuana raids and, um, and uh, with the, I agree with the sheriff as far as Jackson County. We, we need to uh, take a, a firm of action against them, eliminate them in Jackson County. The problem is um, we can't be the Southern Oregon or the California uh, police agency. <clears throat> police agency. Uh, we just don't have the resources. We don't have the manpower. When we uh, take 15 guys to another county or to another state, it's, it's a hardship on the rest of the patrol and uh, the rest of the agency we can't, <clears throat> we can't handle the calls for service when that happens, or we're paying a lot of overtime to cover those, that type of stuff. It's, it's resources we, can't, uh, we don't have to use, and um, we're better, better served to stay in the county lines and uh, take care of those problems there instead of trying to police uh, Southern Oregon and Northern California. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm not ready to stop on this subject. Sorry, follow up. <laughs> not even when they don't know. <laughs> You'll get an opportunity with some other questions. All right, thanks. Uh, this one's for Corey. Um, how do you plan on reducing response times when you believe uh, the patrol has adequate staffing? How do I? Can you, can, can you ask that again, with, please? Let's just stick with how do you plan on reducing response times? What is your solution? Response times uh, are, are evaluated uh, when someone calls 911, reports to the uh, that they have a problem, and a deputy shows up on uh, or responds to their call. That's that's what we look at as how quickly we're we're getting to to calls, and the the way to evaluate this is certainly. You can, you can almost build your budget around how you respond, respond to calls. And uh, that, that's going to come with, with staffing. If, if the average uh, response time in the sheriff's office is around 14 minutes, then we need to uh, look at that with uh, how, how many officers do we, or how many deputies do we have uh, on patrol to, to respond to that? And it, it, is it a staffing issue? Right now, uh, staffing with the sheriff's office, there's some, there's some positions that I, I think need to uh, be used in, in patrol. We've already heard about the, uh, the million dollar uh, Antara system. If, if that comes at the expense of uh, threatening 60 deputies' jobs, then, then that technology isn't going to do any good. You, you need those, those bodies to respond to 
to, uh, to calls. So in addition to that, uh, I, I see uh, other wasted positions in the sheriff's office that uh, there's supervisors that aren't supervising people. Uh, that could be uh, a position in, in patrol. And you, you monitor your response times by your staffing and you budget uh, for your staffing. Thank you. I'm glad. That's good. <laughs> you know, it's it's sure different when you don't sit in the seat because you don't. Uh, you a lot of times you either have a skewed or inaccurate view of how things really work. Uh, running the Jackson County Sheriff's Office, a 2,800 square mile uh, sheriff's office, and running uh, the city of Ashland, for example, is a, it, they're two different jobs and I am dialed in on how to run the sheriff's office uh, I've done a good job with it if if you're thinking about a 14 minute response time over 2800 square miles with the deputies we got we do a good job is that perfect no how much do you want to pay because it's all about money it's all about money we could be Josephine County that pays 56 cents a thousand and we could have a sheriff and maybe two deputies Monday through Friday 8 to 5 or you can have what you have now the more people want to pay the more we can do the other thing is they don't understand the budget they don't understand how you get the money the sheriff doesn't just walk up to the bank and get the money that comes from the, the Board of Commissioners and it comes from the Budget Committee they set the budget I get a number this year it happens to be about $21 million. And that's what I have to run the sheriff's office on. And I have to provide all the different services and, and do everything that the sheriff's office does on that budget. And that takes relationships, which I have, and working with people, which I have. We have been on budget or underspent our budget for 12 years. I've not come to the people and asked for more money. I think we do a hell of a job. I'm proud of my men and women uh, out there that, that do that job. And you have to be able to handle a variety of things. It isn't to one call here or one call there. It's spread over the county. There's search and rescue. You may be that person that's laying at the 8,600 foot level of Mount McLaughlin and you've been injured and you need us with that helicopter that everybody thinks is a waste of money to come get you before dark. We do a good job. Our personnel, they do a, a good job. Um, but I, I think our patrol staff has been depleted. Um, and we can reduce that uh, response time simply by having more people in, out on patrol doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, boots on the ground. Uh, the high-tech million dollar satellite system is not going to do that for us. We need people in the cars, out on the street, and being able to deal uh, with incidents and be able to uh, fully investigate uh, crimes as they're, as they're reported. Part of the problem is that our deputies are going from call to call to call and not having the time to, to deal with those those burglary calls, those theft calls, and so they go unsolved. Uh, we get more people out on the road, and we can deal with those uh, uh, types of incidents better and more to our capability. Thank you. The next question is for each of you, and it relates to the Second Amendment. If the president were to issue an executive order outlawing semi-automatic handguns or any type of firearms and federal marshals, marshals came to your office with the names and addresses of persons owning such firearms, would you assist in confiscation of those firearms? I would like to add to it too, if they did not come to your office with a list, would you provide them with one? No. 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 Thank you. Next question is to each of you. Do we have too many laws in your opinion? 
<laughs> There's not enough time in the night. <laughs> you know, it's been said here earlier that things, search and seizure changes, everything changes. We are a government that is bloated and we are too big and we need to be substantially smaller. Unfortunately, right now, it's the system that we're strapped with. And do I like it? I absolutely don't like it. I mean, I, I can't even, I, I don't even want to get on this subject. I don't like it so much because I could go on for an hour about all the problems that we have with the way business is done. Uh, and, you know, they talk, let's use the million dollars that both my opponents have said that I've wasted and stuff. The first thing is that's, that money can't be used for personnel. They don't know what pot it comes in. Money get to go in a pot. There's capital outlay pot, there's wages pot, and you know that money can't be used to put per personnel on. So let's put it into equipment that makes us more efficient. The helicopter, you know, the rental contract, there's certain pots. That money was reimbursed, most of that stuff, uh, uh, by the federal government on different funding streams. Over a three year period, we used about 500 and some thousand dollars of helicopter aviation contracts and money, 540 some thousand dollars about. And all but 94,000 of it was reimbursed through federal contracts and 94,000 of it came out of a pot, you know, for the general fund. But for the service we get, it's huge. Uh, so, you know, government, we've got too many laws. We've got We've got to shrink it. We've got to do a lot of things. And at the sheriff's office, we do a good job of managing our money. This, this nonsense about there being wasteful spending is just that. There's nonsense. They're talking about a position here, a position there, uh, and such. And you have to be a well-rounded wheel. It isn't, you can't just put a bunch of deputies on the road and change overnight what's going to happen. We have a lot of functions, and neither one of these guys understand it. Uh, absolutely, we have too many laws, and we're completely over-regulated, but remember, we don't, we don't make the laws, unfortunately, we have to enforce them, but yeah, we're, we're an over-regulated over society, and uh, we do have uh, way too many laws. Well, well I'll agree with that, because I've, I've uh, had to deal with those law books, and, and to get from one end to the other, it would take you a lifetime. Um, but as far as what the sheriff's talking about, I do understand, and, and uh, about what the priorities are and and the budget and the the necessity of using those resources wisely um, we do need more people on the street um, we need uh, basic equipment that we're, we're not getting and uh, it would serve the the community much better by uh, addressing those issues instead of spending it on satellite communication system. As a follow-up to that question, do you believe as the sheriff you have the authority to nullify or disobey any law you believe to be unconstitutional? Why or why not? I would say no. We're sworn to uphold the, the, the Constitution of the United States and it's uh, that's that's our that's our duty, and that's what we have to follow. And we we all swear an oath to uh, to do that. We do swear an oath to uphold all the laws, and and uh, and I think that that uh, everyone here at the table has done that, and and done a good job. Uh, you know, there's there's constitutional, there's laws, and there's the Constitution, and and uh, you have to be very careful that that you don't uh, kind of like the gun question. I mean, you you got to be very careful um, because the Constitution uh, trumps some law where they're going to come in and and say what size uh, you know magazine or what what things uh, you know what type of gun or or whatever. So people have the right to bear arms. And in this county, they're going to be able to do that. And, uh, you know, I don't, there's a lot of things I don't like to see uh, with mass shootings, but everybody tries to make it about the gun. And uh, my opponent on the left here, he hit the nail on the head earlier when it, when it came to mental health. We have a lot of issues with, with mental health issues. And 
a lot of that comes from the drugs. It, it's, you know, you can, and it doesn't make any difference whether it's, you know, green dope or it's alcohol or it's heroin or meth, it's drugs and people are making bad decisions and it's causing a lot of mental health issues. And that's a huge problem for the sheriff's office. Uh, you know, so we've got we to gotta work on these things. I think the important thing is that uh, we have to abide by the Constitution. That's, we, we've taken an oath. Personally, I take that very serious. And uh, the, the U.S. Constitution, the Oregon Constitution, probably the most important documents we have. And we, we need to abide by them as, as the top enforcement officer in the, in the county. Thank you. Um, it has evidently been reported that about a third of the students in Medford schools are currently on some form of heroin, whether it be heroin or oxycodone, <coughs> oxycontin. Is this an accurate number? And if not, what is your estimate of high school drug use or adolescent drug use? I, I don't have a clue if that's accurate numbers, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, a third of them seems a little high, um, but I don't know where that information come from, came from, so I don't, I don't think I can say it's not accurate, but it, it seems high. My kids went through um, the Medford School District. Um, their friends went through it. I, I never saw uh, any of that amongst kids. I know there's drug use, but a third of them, that seems a little bit high for uh, opiate type drugs in, in the high school. I don't know the percentage on that, that piece of it. I know that we're seeing, uh, clear down into the middle school, we're seeing marijuana use in, in the schools with, with young kids. And, uh, and I'm sure that's a gateway drug to a lot of other things. I'm sure that there is other types of drug use. I can't speak specifically. To the, whether the heroin, heroin numbers uh, would be that high, I'd hate to believe that our future generations, uh, that that would be true, because it's, it's a sad day for America if that's the case. I don't know if it's a third either, but the problem in our valley is prescription drugs, and these young kids are getting prescription drugs, and they're getting it from their, their parents' uh, cabinets, they're getting it from their grandparents. When they're going over to their friends, friends they're getting it from those cabinets. Those prescription drugs, which is a huge problem amongst uh, young high school kids, uh, is a problem. So, and, and that is opiates, and it leads to your heroin use. So in order to, to uh, work on that and combat that, we, we have to continue to get the information out to people to lock up your medication. You don't know, especially if you have young high school kids, and because you never know who's going to come over if their friends are going to come over and and, and start taking your uh, pills that's a big part of it I know all of our agencies now have a drug drop-off box for prescription pills to try to help out with this they're at the sheriff's office they're at the Medford Police Department they're at the Ashton Police Department talent if you have extra prescription drugs or you're not taking your full prescription there are places to dispose of those we need to continue to try to keep prescription drugs out of uh, young people's uh, hands because th that is the problem that is where that is what is leading to the heroin use and as a follow-up in your opinion what is the cause of the drug use um, and what would be a solution well I think I mentioned that a little bit it, the, the, the cause is the easy access uh, you can when you can go over to your friend's house and you can raid uh, their parents uh, uh, medicine cabinet it's too easy uh, access is the problem so uh, it's the education piece of telling people to make sure that you uh, lock up your prescription drugs uh, educating the public that this is a problem educating the public that there are places to take your extra prescription drugs uh, to the different law enforcement agencies that drop them off are, are all solutions but it's a combination of a uh, place to dispose them and education but uh, it's just it's too easy accessed right now I'd agree with that except that it's way deeper. The dr this drug use is way deeper. Back in the old days, uh, there was a family unit, and, and you had the father who uh, went out and, and plowed the ground and, and provided and, and put food on the table, and the mother who took care of the kids, and it was a family unit. 
and there was less divorce in the, in the United States of America at that time because people stayed together and they, they worked through it. Sometimes even if they didn't like each other, they still <laughs> together and they maintained the family unit and they raised that child. And that's, that's our future. As we have progressed, and as the government has got too big, I might add, uh, we have created folks, we've got a lot of good kids, but the family unit is all broken up. People are having to, because of taxation, people are having to work uh, two jobs. The husband has to go out and work. The wife has to go out and work. The children are having to be watched in a daycare center and such. The problem is a cultural problem, ladies and gentlemen. And until we change that, until we get back to family values, and until we get uh, government dialed down to where uh, somebody can make a living on a, on a single income, which those days are gone, and until we stop all the entitlement uh, nonsense that's going on, where we're almost paying people to stay home and lay on the couch and eat Cheetos, until we stop that nonsense, we're going to have this problem. This is a cultural problem that we have in America and an access problem. I do agree with um, with Paul's about uh, Corey about the education part of it. It it, it is a big uh, component of drug education. And you know, one of the things that uh, I would do as sheriff is we currently don't have any school resource officers in in any of the schools. Um, uh, I would uh, put a school resource officer back in into the especially the White City Schools. Medford does a good job with a school resource officer. I'm not sure if Ashland has a school resource officer, but the county doesn't have any more. Uh, fighting the drugs on the street, yes, we have one person assigned to, uh, to Madge. His assignment is gang activity. Uh, we need, in the Sheriff's Office, to combat the, the street drugs more effectively. We, we don't have any type of program right now to do that. Uh, we have a big issue with, with drugs in White City. Uh, the patrol guys there, they do a great job, uh, but, but they don't get enough support to actively work the drug dealers uh, in that area. Um, I think with the education part with SRO and better enforcement of, of the drug laws, and especially in White City, I think we do a better job of combating the, the drug use. Thank you. Um, for each of you, please explain uh, the importance of fiscal transparency in your office, uh, your opinion, and how you plan to provide that to the people of Jackson County. Uh, I'll open the books. Um, Actually, if uh, public records, if you uh, do a public records re request, you can look at the budget now, uh, and you can see where the money is being spent. Um, it, it's it's a process. It, it'll cost you money to do that, but it's not a big deal. That it, if you know what to ask for, it you can see that, and I agree with that. Uh, if someone came in uh, wanting to look at the books, see where, where I'm spending money, I have no issue with that. Uh, one of the things I would like to see improved is uh, the sheriff talked about uh, the county uh, uh, budget committee giving him a lump sum. And from that point on, the sheriff, as an elected official, can spend that money any way he wants. There's, there's absolutely no oversight after that money gets put into the sheriff's budget. Um, I would like to see that changed and, uh, and have some oversight uh, to keep a, the sheriff honest and, uh, uh, and be accountable to where that money's going. You need to get yourself a printing press is what you need to do because there's only so much money. and. Uh, and any, any disparaging comments about honesty at the sheriff's office I take to heart. There is a process. The budget is online. The Jackson County uh, budget is online. There are public records if you choose to come in and see some particular line item. We go through an audit process, uh, a very rigorous audit process. And most of those audits, Mike Winters, Jackson County Sheriff, calls for to make sure that everything is in line, is correct, where it's supposed to be, identifies any type of problems. And I'm a sheriff that when I first took over, 
I arrested my admin secretary. She stole $80,000. I arrested her. She ended up going to federal prison. And there was another incident. I've cleaned, the, I've cleaned up a bunch of this, this kind of nonsense. We uh, pass our audits. We are well inspected, well taken care of. And there isn't a bunch of this uh, black helicopter shenanigan stuff that was uh, put out in that last statement. Were you saying the Antero system was from seizure funds? What part of the budget did that come out of? It, it, we have capital outlay uh, projects and we underspend our budget and then s the system that was put into uh, Shady Cove School came out of drug uh, forfeiture. So we've used, we have used, we've taken drug dealers' money and, and turned it to uh, protect our kids because we have a state-of-the-art system up in Shady Cove. Okay, that's, I wanted to clarify that. So it's all, it's all seizure money. It's not all seizure money. When you build fiscal, fiscal transparency, when, and what Bob's talking about, Oregon budget law says when, when, when I build my budget, uh, I have different divisions, different units. I have my patrol division. I have my corrections division, detectives, whatever it is. I build budget and I, I decide uh, how much is going to be spent in each one of those areas. So, so that's where your tran transparency can come from. I'm, I'm thinking, okay, for this year in corrections, I'm going to need this much. For this year in patrol, I'm going to need, need that much. Oregon budget law, once your budget is approved by the budget committee, then you can technically spend that money wherever you want per, per Oregon budget law. So if I over budget in this account or if I have excess money here, I can use it in, in different areas. I think the, but the, the, the fiscal transparency comes, if, if I'm going to tell the public or I'm, I'm going to tell my budget committee that uh, I'm spending this much in, my, in this division, this much in this, and this much in that, then I'm going to, I'm going to hold, hold to, to uh, trying to maintain those budgets and not have uh, other priorities that come out uh, that are not in the budget uh, automatically just show up. So that's where the transparency would come with me, holding to those uh, different sections. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Sheriff Winters. Where did the money come from for the Antares Emergency Management System? We, I think we just talked about that. Okay, came, can you be a little more specific? Came out of our budget. <laughs> what part? I'll have to go look it up for you. Okay, but that is public information, correct? Yes. I think you said most part of it came out of uh, seizures, seizure. drug seizures, and the other was out of capital. Instead of guessing about this, why don't we just get the facts? Drug seizure paid for the, uh, the, the project that we did up at Shady Cove School. We took forfeiture money and put up there. And then we had uh, various pots of money where we were underspent or we were well within our budget that we, we did uh, journal vouchers and, and moved around so that we could provide this system. Uh, this system, Jackson County is responsible. Uh, it's funny that everybody's, uh, you know, and I know who's dialed in on it. It's not, it's not your average citizen because we're the ones that are going to respond when you're in trouble. We have to manage our assets as good as we can manage our assets. We're, we're like the little Navy SEAL group. We have a lot of technology. We have a lot of uh, different systems and such because we don't have an abundance of money running out of the Jackson County uh, coffers. So we have, to, we have to move forward. We have to move into the next century, you know, the next wave of technology. and, and manage everything well. It's my job to be able to do that. It's my job to be able to respond to you when you're in trouble. And you need to trust me to do that. I've done it. We've, we've done a lot of good work. And we are a good sheriff's office. I, I think what everybody's concern as sheriff is, is we're coming up with a million dollars. And, and we're, we, we go and present our budget to our budget committee and we say these are our issues. And if you look at last year's budget, they, they specifically say some of their issues within the, the sheriff's office. Those issues I, I said earlier, they're mental health issues. 
their uh, jail issues, where they're, they're forced released. For the first time in the Sheriff's Office budget last year, they mentioned the amount of domestic violence that, uh, that, they're, that they're tracking. So you budget for all those different div divisions. If, if you're saying that you're pulling extra money out of those different divisions to come up with a million dollars, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money that can be going to the issues that you talk to your budget committee about that you wanted to invest in. And I think that's the, where, where people are, are, are confused. If we're, if we're able to come up with a million dollars, then why are we threatening 60 deputies with their jobs and, and, and not having those first responders out on, out on the street? That, that's, a, that's a concern of mine. It's not, it's not the system. It's, 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 not, it's not having the system. It's, it's, it's how we got there. And is it at the cost of, of threatening deputies their jobs? Is it at the cost of an overcrowded jail? And, and those are the different priorities that, that, that I think of when I think of where these uh, expenses come from. Okay. Uh, Corey and I agree on that. The, uh, the, the million dollars could have been used uh, at other places. Where our, our deputies out on the road, they have uh, the, their computers in their cars are outdated. Um, they, ha they need to be replaced. Um, there's plenty of equipment that could be bought that the, the deputies can use out on the street uh, uh, to be able to do their jobs better. And the bottom line is we, c we need more deputies on the road. Uh, a million dollars here, $150,000 here for the Nexar system in Shady Cove. Uh, yeah, they, they come out of a pot, but why are we spending money when our deputies need more deputies on the street and they need equipment to do their jobs more efficiently? Okay, last but not least, nope. we're almost out Don't of I get time. to rebut that? No. <laughs> it's illegal. But you may, you may you. be able to do that with this question. Um, what are the two major law enforcement problems facing Jackson County, and what would be your solution? Please keep it to two. I know that there are probably more, but pick the top two most important to you and what your solution would be. The top two most pressing problems, law enforcement problems facing Jackson County. Uh, drug use, and I think. The Without a doubt, I, I believe drug use is the number one problem. And we are a part of every uh, drug team in the Valley. And or, I mean, we are either part of it or spearheaded it. Uh, so we take it very seriously. The second thing, and I'm gonna go right back to this Antari system and the emergency management piece, Jackson County is trying to position itself so that we are ready to respond to emergencies. When we have a Cascadia event, and it happens, and it will, you have to be able to respond to that. You have to be able to move your assets. You have to keep transportation routes open so that business can get done, so supplies can get in. You have to think about all this. It's not just the city of Ashland that we're thinking about, and it's just not graveyard up the Jackson County Jail. This is a big job. It takes big picture thinking to prepare to be able to use those assets as good as we can use them to get there and take care of you when you're in your time of need and you call us. And you have to think beyond, uh, you know, you just have to be a big picture thinker and look at the whole thing. And you can't spend that money because it's illegal, Bob. Well, we spent it, so I don't, I don't know about that. Um, Spend it legally. When, when the sheriff talks about getting assets to out to emergency uh, for emergency preparedness, if you don't have the bodies on the street, and you don't have the bodies, all the technology in the world is not going to help the citizens in, in in time of need. You need bodies out there to do that. Uh, uh, the I'm not sure how the Antari system is going to open up roadways, uh, but. Uh, Without deputies out on the street, um, which, by the way, is would be a priority, uh, uh, it's not going to do any good 
who you can talk to and if you can talk to Southern California or not. The other part, the other part of it would be um, the correction side of things. Um, these deputies have to deal with uh, mental illness in that jail every day. Uh, we need to better uh, partnership with mental health to try to get, we're housing a lot of mental health patients in, in the jail. It's a hardship on the, on the deputies, it's a hardship on the patients, and we need, need to do a better job of getting the resources to help these people and instead of housing them in the jail, the, the patrol officers out on the street are, are kind of stuck with these guys. Uh, they, so they arrest them for minor offenses, trespassing, disorderly conduct. They wind up in our jail. We can't release them because uh, they'll just go right back out and, and do the same thing. Meanwhile, uh, our deputies have to deal with that. We can do a better job of uh, partnershiping with uh, the appropriate agencies and not house these people uh, in our jail. Would you mind repeating the two question the the question again? Sure. But what are the major law, two major law enforcement problems facing Jackson County today, and what are your solutions for them? Uh, I think the first for me the the, the Jackson County Jail. Uh, if if we're talking about almost force releasing uh, five thousand people out of the jail, that impacts all of our communities, no matter where you live, and uh, that is that is a big. That is a big issue to me, and it's uh, certainly getting the resources to uh, staff the jail or maybe even starting the discussion of uh, what, what do we need to do to uh, either uh, find different areas to take people or uh, increase our, our jail space. So, so the, the jail is one of the, the biggest issues. The other thing is, is fiscal management, and, and we're seeing it with the uh, collapse of some of our uh, counties uh, around us and how that's going to affect uh, Jackson County citizens. It's something that we certainly need to, to keep an eye on. I think we have to have a discussion as uh, Jackson County residents and taxpayers of if there is a call to assist some of these other counties uh, because of their collapse, what is our re re response going to be? Thank you. Okay. We're going to change up the end a little bit since it seems there's some good back and forth between and amongst you. So the closing statements will be five minutes and then a two minute rebuttal from each candidate. We've, we've discussed a lot about uh, changing, moving uh, different factions around priorities with, with money and, and how we're all going to spend money or do things differently. Uh, I have overseen our, our, our budget. I have prepared our uh, budget narrative and presented to our uh, budget committee. I, I, I understand that. Uh, if, if you're looking for uh, a, a sheriff that's going to bring change to the county, then, then I'm, I'm, I'm your candidate. And I've gotten results in, in every aspect that I have done professionally and, and personally. And a couple of those are is, uh, successfully managing our, our budget uh, presentation. Uh, I've successfully done contract negotiations with our sworn and non-sworn uh, police officers. Uh, I've successfully increased the amount of cases in our detective division from in 2009 we took 104 cases, and with the same amount of uh, detectives in, in 2013, we took 180 cases. I've gotten more efficiency out of, out of our people in our organization, just at our police department level. At the county level, we've talked a lot about mental health tonight. At the county level, I created the first crisis intervention training for this county. And what that is, it was a, a training to train people on uh, responding to somebody with mental health who is having a crisis and what resources are out there to uh, take these uh, people jails a lot of times the default we also talked about the jail tonight and, and taking people to jail what other resources uh, do we have and that was in 2009 that, that we started looking at this problem of, of mental health and uh, at a county level we, we invited the city of Medford the Jackson County Sheriff's Office they all attended uh, collaborated with with those different organizations 
And uh, now it's, a, it's something that the Medford Police Department has uh, started in, in 2013 and, and wanted to train all their police officers on. So it's a successful thing. So I have done those things at, at a county level, at a national level. Uh, the, the sheriff's talked a lot about the big picture. He's right. We have to understand the, the big picture. Uh, the city of Ashland is not my only experience. I worked for a, a, a sheriff's office three times of, of Jackson County. I understand a, a large county. Uh, I've, I've been to the national trainings to, to learn about innovation and, and how we're going to make change. Right now, I'm, uh, we're part of uh, a national program on, on sexual assault and violence against women. When the, uh, when the Department of Defense was looking around the country to see who had the best sexual assault program, they called the city of Ashland. And last, uh, no, last December, I went and, and uh, testified in front of a congressional panel uh, about our program. So I have acted on a, on a national level about th these, these things. If you're looking for change, if, if you're looking for uh, a new direction for the, the, for the sheriff's office, different priorities, uh, I believe I'm your candidate. And thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you. Next is Sheriff Mike Winters. I honestly can't believe some of the statements were made here uh, tonight. There's things that you have to do within the Constitution and within the bounds of the law. And uh, not thinking that the sheriff has the ability as the chief law enforcement officer for the county to stand up to the federal government is incorrect and inaccurate information because we do. With respect to the budget and budget law and everything, that, that money that's used for that system that everyone wants to talk so much about that is going to save lives, that has already uh, taken drug seizure money and put it in the Shady Cove Elementary and Middle School so that we can better protect our kids. And as we get more drug money off the streets, we're going to do more schools to try to protect our kids. Uh, I'm proud of that. I'm not going to take. I'm not going to take that laying down. I'm proud of what the, uh, the I've done and what the Jackson County Sheriff's done to try to uh, protect our kids. Uh, the traffic team. You know, I just. I'm going to give you a snapshot of what we've been able to do as a team at the Jackson County Sheriff's Office. The traffic team, we've reduced, when we started that in 2004, we were the second highest in, in the state for traffic fatalities on highways in Jackson County. And last night, I think, unfortunately, we reaped some of that again. So we started a traffic team, and we have reduced those. We've cut those in half, and we've consistently maintained that the entire time since the inception of that traffic team in 2004. We have a SWAT unit. We didn't have a SWAT team back in the old days. We had guys with rifles running around who were marksmen and went out and shot a target or two. We have a SWAT team. We have a well-qualified SWAT team. This nonsense about that the deputies don't have equipment, I got deputies from Josephine and Siskiyou <coughs> County begging to, to look at the equipment and the things we have. Siskiyou County, they take the cars that we rotate out and they drive them another 90,000 miles and such because they're running 200, 250,000 miles because they don't have money. They don't have support from their commissioners and their budget committee like I do. I'm proud of the support that I have from my commissioners, my budget committee, and the things that we've been able to do during these tough economic times. I haven't asked you for a dime. I have stayed on budget and underspent that budget 12 years, I have a solid record of achievement. The K-9 unit, we have a K-9 unit. We, we started the Child is Missing program here. We were the first in Oregon to start that. I started that, I brought it in. Uh, CSO program, the Jackson County has an excellent CSO program. Crime reports for civilian research, cold case homicide unit, there's no other one in Jackson County. We started it. And they're working those cases, and they're trying to bring resolution and closure to the families so that we can uh, get some of these cases solved. Because the, the, the tap is never off for our detectives. So they, this unit specializes just on cold cases, and is going to try to bring resolution to families who are grieving because their case hasn't uh, been closed. We do have an air rescue unit. And you know what? I'm proud of it. I'm not going to back off of it one minute. We have a 
we have a 902 helicopter, we have a contract uh, sh ship out of Ashland. The nearest rescue ship is the National Guard that can operate in, at these high altitudes. We train with, a, with the uh, Coast Guard, but their ships are heavy and they don't want to fly in the mountains. They're used to going out and doing dangerous stuff in the oceans that we don't want any part of. But when it comes to mountain rescue, we're the best in the business at it. And, and if you're that person, and I'm telling you, if you're that person at 4 o'clock on a July day at 8,600 foot level of Mount McLaughlin, and you have fell down and had a hole half the size of my fist in your head, you're going to want that helicopter pilot to come up and take you off that. It takes our search and rescue people six hours to ascend that mountain with all their gear. And then because of the trail and the rugged terrain, passing him down hand over hand, we wouldn't have got off there that night. That man would have died. That man would have died had it not been for that air rescue system. I've run that system for, for less money out of the general fund than it would take to pay two pilots to sit at that office 24-7. Mm -hmm. And the rest of it has been back filled with federal money. So I'm proud of that rescue unit. I'm not backing off of it. Emergency care, uh, Communications of Southern Oregon. It used to be on top of uh, the courthouse, oldest building. We have a new comm center. We started the Corsar program, the summer program. We've re we're going to regionalize the uh, Amber Alert. We've a part of MADGE, the high-tech crime unit, and we're open at 60 beds in about two weeks at Jackson County Jail. And we're going to log more people. My time is up. Thank you. My list is longer. <laughs> <laughs> Put it on Facebook. <laughs> Thank you. Good idea. You know, I, I decided to run uh, for sheriff uh, when... It's a directional mic. Am I not talking into it? There you go. Okay. I, I decided to run for sheriff when when I started seeing uh, the, the, the decline in our patrol staff, our inability to uh, uh, field enough units out on the street for, for the safety of the deputies, the, um, the, the morale dropping. Um, you know, recently uh, the association, they took a, a vote of, of endorsement. I got 52% of that, that, that vote. Uh, the sheriff got 4%. That, that will tell you that um, whatever he's doing, he's not being supported by his people. I, I was asked to, by many times, to to put in a run for the sheriff, uh, and and I saw the need for that. Um, I know this agency. The uh, I know corrections. I know how it operates. I know patrol. I know how that operates. I know SWAT. I know how that operates. It's it's something that that needs to be a full-time job. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how, um, and the sheriff has done a great job, you know, but, but the time has come to, to, to pass the baton. Uh, I'm gonna step into that and refocus our, uh, our mission back to law enforcement, making this community safer. Uh, Corey probably does a great job. I, I hear he does great things in, in Ashland. He's, 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 he's a nice young guy, but uh, he's not qualified for this position. Um, I am the only one with the credentials uh, to run this agency effectively. I get the big picture. Uh, I understand the budget. I uh, have the support of the troops and the, the rest of the, the staff in, in, the, in the sheriff's office. And, and we need a change, and we need to refocus. We need to make this community much safer, and we can do that without raising the budget, and we can do that uh, almost immediately. Uh, when, when you have, uh, don't have enough sergeants to, to uh, cover all the, uh, the shifts, then there's an issue, and uh, we need to change that. So. Appreciate your time. Thank you. And two minute rebuttal, we'll start with Deputy Chief Falls. <coughs> In the state of Oregon, there's different levels of certification. I have the highest level of police certification 
out of any of the candidates. I have an executive level certification. What that means is I have the most executive years of experience, training hours, and education, a combination of that. I'm the only one that's running with an executive level of certification. Uh, that overqualifies me for this position. Uh, we've talked a lot about helicopters and, and terrorist systems and a lot of stuff that you guys uh, probably don't know about or, or really, re really care about. Uh, to me, it's, it's not about equipment, it's about people. And uh, what I would like to, to bring to this county is a, is a focus on, on people and work to uh, increase, our, increase the problems of professional policing today is uh, how does things impact our community? And uh, what are the quality of life or the public safety issues? We talked about a lot of the, uh, the constitutional questions tonight. A lot of those are, are, are quality of life issues. We talked about some of the problems in our county, which is an increase in crime, mental health issues, uh, drug issues, heroin issues, and how does that impact our community? I'm going to work to on those problems, and it's, and it's not going to be always about equipment. It's going to be about people, and how can we work together uh, to talk about those in, things that are impacting our community? And that's going to be a focus of mine. Those are going to be some of the, the clear differences that uh, we're going to work for. Thank you. Thank you. And next would be Sheriff Mike Butters. Uh, Bob's right. He got 52% of the union support. And... Uh, let me tell you, I'm not everybody's best friend, but I'm not there to be everybody's best friend. I run an agency. I'm the CEO. And I'm the sheriff until I'm not the sheriff. And I work for the citizens. I work for each and every one of you in this audience and the other 200 and X thousand that are out there to provide a absolute best law enforcement agency I can in every kind of situation that can possibly come up because you don't want me to fail. We're getting ready to, they keep talking about torch releases. We're about two weeks away from opening up 60 beds, uh, additional beds. But do you think that's going to stop forced releases? What's going to stop forced releases is quick commitment crimes. To fix that cultural problem that we discussed earlier, that's what's going to do it. The teacup is only so big. You can only house so many people. We could put 500 beds down there. We could put 1,000 beds, and they're going to be full. We're going to be doing forced releases at some point until you fix a cultural problem that we're having in the United States of America. We work with all our agencies. We, we, there's no agency except New Orleans City Police Department that we have ever turned down for law enforcement. That's whether it's Ashland, Medford, anybody. If they ask for our resources and what we have, we are there. And we, we believe in working together because the resources are so few, you have to maintain those relationships. And you have to do that because you have to try to provide that service to the citizens. That's who I work for. I know the Constitution. I know I am, I don't shrink in the face of danger. I'm not a willow. I'm not going to be out there uh, trying to figure out what my job is. I'm a three-term sheriff. I know my job. I do my job well. And the Jackson County Sheriff's Office is a top-notch organization. Do your research. Match it up to anybody. Match it up to anybody. And you'll find that we're at the top. I've had numerous people come in and say that there are the five sheriff's offices in the United States doing what we're doing. Thank you. <coughs> Lieutenant Sergeant. Corey talks about his executive uh, uh, certification, and that's that's fine. Um, but I, I want to say that with. with being the jail commander, the patrol commander, and having that management certificate, I, I know how to run those. Uh, the jail is probably one of the uh, most high-risk liability uh, functions that the, the sheriff does. Uh, yeah, I'm assigned there in graveyard. Thanks, sheriff. Uh, uh, but I know that facility, I know the people, I know what, what we can and can't do, I know what the, what the, how to uh, reduce the number of forced releases. Um, yeah, we're going to open 64 more beds uh, probably on Monday, and they will be full. Um, 
in, in no time, but we, we need to find a way to be able to hold uh, these people in jail a, a little bit longer, at least to get to court. And that's something I'll be working on. Um, as far as uh, the, the support from, from the, the troops, you, you need that support, you need that trust. Uh, they trust me as a leader, they trust me as a manager, and I think that vote uh, to just say that is unimportant is disingenuous at best. Uh, and uh, that, that tells you a lot who, uh, who should be running this agency. Um, like I said, you need that trust from the employees. You, you'll get better service from them, and, and I know what they need, and they trust me to do that for them. Well, I would like to say thank you, gentlemen. I know from experience how difficult it is to run for office, and we commend you for stepping up and doing so, and thank you for coming here tonight. <laughs> if I could have everybody remain seated for a moment. We have a couple of housekeeping items um, and a few observations of the candidates tonight. Uh, you're welcome to get up and move around, a little, but please stick around. Um, first off, to everybody here, thank you so much for your questions. They were very enlightening and informative. I think it gave the candidates good direction as to where their, their citizenry or the people that they serve are coming from. Um, first thing I would like to point out is that this should never be the only form of communication between you and your elected public servant. You must always remember that that is, is what they are. They are your elected public servant and that communication must remain open. It is important that you educate them and that, that they in turn educate you. Loma and I have been working with sheriffs across the country, hundreds, for the last seven years. And we have seen the many things that they face. And I can tell you that it's not as easy as we think it is being behind the curtain. So I encourage you to take them up on their offer to open up their books. Look them over. Get online. Scope it out. If something doesn't make sense to you, make a formal request. And if you don't get it, get your answer, make some noise. It's okay. Remember that they work for you. The other thing is that, you know, it's important that each of our elected public officials, not just but in all the elections coming up, understand the duty that they have to their sworn oath and affirmation. And it is just as important that we, the people that they serve, understand what that means also. So reach out to people around you, organizations, get online, do your own research, never take anybody's word for anything. Make sure that you're comfortable with it. But find out what that oath and affirmation means and why it is there and why it's so important for our elected <coughs> officials to understand the meaning behind it themselves because that is where our basis of protection for our liberties and our freedoms come from. And without that understanding, at no time can anybody that we elect serve us properly until they do understand that. So with that, I leave you uh, good night. Thank you very much for coming, and you owe yourselves an applause. For